Welcome to The Reason Roundtable, your weekly podcast and video cast. thank God, uh, brought to you by the magazine of uh, Free Minds and Free Markets. I am Matt Welch, uh, joined by Nick Gillespie, Catherine Mangu Ward, and special guest star, America's own funny man, the boy with the joy toy, the boss with the hot sauce, the once and perhaps future host of this very podcast. Yes, <laughs> Andrew Everlovin Heaton, please clap. Thank you. Thank you. I am I am delighted to be back after the people demanded it. <laughs> We're nothing if not a democracy here mm-hmm. at Reason. So yeah. um, let's get crack a lack and and take advantage of Andrew's uh, preparation for this podcast. He's a uh, last minute uh, replacement for Peter Suderman, who I think is trapped in a vat of bitters. Catherine, I think is that the, what happened? Tragically. To... We only hope that in time he can recover. Um, we only hope. He's the uh, Kate Middleton of this podcast. I, I actually do this a lot for uh, Suderman. Like if he can't go to a family reunion, I come in. I, I kind of view myself as like Santa's helper for Suderman. Yeah. And uh, yeah. we should point out that Peter is stuck getting back from Ayala's birthday, right? Mm-hmm. Birthday party. We can't do that oh, joke I, I, twice I, in a row. We I did invited. that joke last week. Oh yeah, that was, that's got a little bit more juice in it. Uh, no, I wouldn't say it's no. Juice. I yeah. I live in Austin, and Ayla came to my birthday. This is true. She came to my fortieth birthday. We did a sing along yeah. at Pete's Piano Bar, and I was not invited to her birthday, and I was a little offended yeah. by that. I think well, you, you didn't had pass to fill the out. screening. You know, you yeah. had I've to never STI wanted free. to talk yeah. about Come the on. State of the Union so much. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what I want all listeners out there who don't know what we're talking about um, to do is don't try to find out. Uh, and instead, listen to us talk about last week in uh, politics. It's a busy week for America in politics. We had uh, Super Tuesday, which Donald Trump. And Joe Biden basically uh, swept, minus a couple of holdouts in uh, Vermont and American Samoa. Um, then Nikki Haley and Dean Phillips, the Washington generals of the primary process, uh, both stepped out. Uh, Dean Phillips endorsed Biden immediately, and Nikki Haley um, uh, didn't uh, endorse Biden or Trump immediately. We'll see what she does. Uh, after that, uh, the president of the United States, POTUS, they call him, um, delivered a feisty State of the Union address. Um, Republican Senator uh, Katie Britt from Alabama <laughs> did one of the worst rebuttals this side of thirsty in Marco a, Rubio. Yeah, in a in a <laughs> slot that is known for massive fails. That one was so good. So yeah. Good. I the do not joke- think she has taken the title from Michelle Bachman. I just want to go ahead and yeah. put in that bid. Was Bachman the official or was that the Tea Party rebuttal? It doesn't Back matter. They used oh, to have the, yeah, it was the one in my heart that year. Yeah. I, I did not I watch the rebuttal. What made it so awful? Oh, the, now you're asking questions? The content, How do you think this podcast works? <laughs> the content, the delivery, and the setting, which was literally a kitchen. Um, huh. But like a big, like spacious, sterile kind of place that they show you and uh, when you're doing the walkthrough um, of the house. Grage, even. Nice. Yeah, the grage. Uh, going on now with what happened in the politics of last week or ending it, um, the uh, artist formerly known as No Labels or currently known as No Labels announced on Friday that uh, they intend to run a candidate for president just as soon as they can find one. Uh, and then finally last night was the Academy Awards. Uh, great job last night uh, hosting, Andrew. I thought Thank you. you did a, a pretty, uh, pretty Thank good job. Thank you very much. It was an honor. Um, it uh, and the uh, I didn't watch much of it, but it did show that big labor is back, or at least that uh, Ryan Gosling is still hot, um, and they're the usual political uh, little uh, jokes and whatnot. So let's start with the so too, shall we, Catherine? Uh, since the so-called uh, mainstream media has already droned on ad infinitum about Biden's uh, rather energized style uh, and how uh, pumped up Democrats were to see old fight and Joe. Um, let's those of us out here on the perimeter, uh, talk about, uh, the substance a little bit, um, as old fashioned as that might seem, this, uh, might have more resonance this week since Biden is scheduled to unveil the, uh, the white house budget blueprint. So Catherine, uh, you presided over some drunk watching, I think of the state union address at the reason, uh, DC HQ, uh, what was your overall policy vibe 
of the thing. And then please, if you will, lead us into drilling down into specific policies that Biden talked about or unveiled at a State of the Union address. Yeah, I just want to, first of all, clarify, I I led drinking watching of the State of the Union, but not drunk watching of the State of the Union because we are professionals here. Even Billy Binion? DC office, especially Billy Binion. Okay. And um, my, the overall vibe policy-wise was was absolute, perfect, pure forgettability. Like if it wasn't my job to remember some policy proposal that occurred in that State of the Union, I would remember nothing. It was sort of the casual laundry list. It was a bunch of stuff we've heard before. It was – and this is what most State of the Unions are like now. But it, this one was – particularly unremarkable, not only because no one was watching for policy, everyone was just watching to see if grandpa could keep it together past bedtime, but also because there is no policy. Policy is over. We don't do policy anymore in this country, really. So um, that was that was not a surprise, I guess, um, though still a bummer. So to be clear, you can't name a single one. I can, and I will. But again, yeah. I, it, only because it is, I literally get paid to do yeah. this. Um, so the policy that jumped out at me was when he said, truly in his best like infomercial voice, uh, when you refinance your home, you can save a thousand dollars or more. Like, first of all, what? Like the State of the Union. I you know, I don't love it that like numbers having to do with the government now mostly start with. T's and B's, like it's all trillions and billions. It's just like large, large, large amounts of money. Ideally, those numbers would be smaller. But $1,000 is too small of a number to talk about in the State of the Union. That is infomercial stuff. Um, I do not own a house. Uh, God willing, I will never own a house. So I did have to go figure out what exactly was going on here. And I did, um, which is that title insurance is a complicated uh, thing, but it turns out that this actually kind of might be goodish in that it's a, like a wee smidge of deregulation. So basically, lenders have to buy insurance against the possibility that the house that you are um, borrowing money from them to buy might be like, oops, owned by someone else or like have a tax lien on it or something. Um, when you are refinancing a home that has already gotten title insurance on it, through the previous lender, you don't have to buy that again anymore by law, at least some of the time. That's it. This couldn't be less interesting or important. I'm so sorry I even talked to you about it. Was, but like, I, I'm even wow. sorrier that he talked to us about it. I think that should be it. done at the UN level, not at right? the Right. I mean, government. right? Like, let's have the one world government decide this because it's just as it makes just as much sense as Joe Biden having a single thought about this. The banks themselves should obviously choose whether or not they need insurance on properties that they're lending against that's an easy answer um i yeah i now regret that this was the assignment that i this created. is this is what uh, was in there boring fiddly shit uh, uh uh nick what uh uh what was your overall uh like policy vibe check was it basically similar to Catherine's about old uh, president corn pop and then on your specific one um is it going to have something to do with snickers uh, no, but uh, I mean, obviously, he needed to eat the Snickers before, during, and after to change into Betty White. Uh, I liked the vibe of it, and I'm think I now think of uh, Joe Biden as Joey Pep. He is like Neil Cassidy or you know Dean Moriarty and uh, on the road, or you know you could see him driving the Merry Prankster bus now, like hopped up on speed because he came out all shouty and shouty and animated. I like that. I like that Biden, and I like the fact that he immediately attacked Trump. Uh, you know, he, he went into Ukraine, he went into Trump, he, uh, et cetera. I thought that was uh, pretty good. Like Catherine, the speech was, you know, god awful in its substance for the most part. But the other thing he did, and and like, yeah, he was smart because he did this all in about the first three minutes. He also brought up abortion. Um, although in a cowardly act, did not use the word abortion. I wish he had, but he said, you know what, um, if, you know, when I get a second term, the actual line was, I will restore Roe v. Wade as the law of the land again, which I took to mean that he is going to, you know, push for national legislation that would, in, you know, in, create the uh, framework that was at work uh, under Roe on a national level. And he also said in this, you know, what was interesting about this 
State of the Union, I think, compared to others, it was very political and it was very aimed at the uh, 2024 election. And he said, you know what? Republicans did this. Trump alone did this. It was his judges who did this. And every time this stuff came up on the ballot, they lost. You know, And if they can take away this right, what are the rights they're going to do? I think that's like actually... I, I, you know, it's actually good politicking. Um, so I found that uh, all somewhat interesting. Um, but then, you know, as the speech went on, you kind of, and this happens if you take a lot of amphetamines, you know, it just kind of becomes an endless whir and buzz. And, um, you know, uh, but uh, Joey Pep, you know, he, uh, he brought it back. Now he's got to, he's got to continue to make this character appear on a regular basis I think he's got to do the uh, the push up competition with Robert F Kennedy, um, and he's got to be chopping some wood or something like that. In the uh, maybe he can wash the Corvette in front of the White House, Matt, and take his shirt off and kind of only like if do. he's wearing Daisy Dukes. That's yeah, of course. Th- those are the work, rules. And work boots, of course. Like, but what else would you wear when you're washing the car in front of the White House? So <laughs> Joey Pep is back. Uh, there's so many images that I want to scrub from my memory already in this short period of time in this podcast. And, and Heaton is barely spoken. Uh, so that's, <laughs> yeah. that's I'm, I'm minding my manners. Uh, I appreciate that. Uh, now stop minding your manners <clears throat> and start telling us, uh, your, uh, overall impression of the state of the union and one specific policy that you thought was noteworthy of comment. Okay. Andrew. Uh, so Kickoff, I, I hate State of the Union addresses. I know that this is a, a, a common opinion. Uh, quick fun fact, since we're basically emulating the monarch's address over in the United Kingdom, we ought to just go full throttle on that, in my opinion. Like, they have wonderful pageantry. The, the king takes a hostage every year uh, that, that sits at Buckingham Palace. It is a literal hostage in case Parliament takes control of the king. Uh, and so we should do that. We, there should be a hostage at the White House. They have to take Marjorie Taylor Greene and put her in the green room or something. And uh, they have a representative of the king go to the House of Commons where a door is ceremonially slammed in the guy's face. And then they go to the House of Lords. But, and this is the crucial bit that I wish they would do with the American president, they make the king sit in a vestibule for a few minutes and just stare at the death warrant of Charles the I. They make oh, him stay in a true. little room with a, a placard on the wall talking about the time they cut a guy's head off. I think that that would be very beneficial. Um, I agree with everybody's assessment about the uh, the just lack of substance in it. it. I thought the State of the Union address was kind of like a bag of potato chips where 80 percent of it's just air and then the bottom 20 percent of it is just empty calories. Of the remaining parts that were there, the the stuff that I thought was noteworthy that I could actually stay uh, awake for and pay attention to – um, whenever Biden got into economics, it, he, he got down into his real essence, which is if, if there's a grease fire, throw more grease at it. If student loans cost too much, we should be paying for more student loans. Never really getting into well, why is that? that? These things that the federal government is already funding tend to be increasing in money. Well, give, give them more money. Although he, he did have a couple of things that I liked, um, little bits. Uh, he he talked about having good jobs in high school that don't require college degrees, kind of alluded to an apprentice program. I like that. Um, he uh, appears to have turned positions on marijuana very briefly. OK, maybe that'll turn into something at some point. He does seem to have directed, uh, I think, the FDA to review scheduling for marijuana. So maybe there's some positive things on that end uh, and one or two other things. But, but broadly speaking, I thought it was uh, – kind of a just nice of Congress to let the old man give a campaign speech and uh, not a whole lot of meat in it. I believe that Jacob Solem's formal analysis of that marijuana line in the speech was um, <laughs> like that was I'm like summarizing, but he was basically like, I'll believe it when I see it, um, yeah. which I think is fair. He doesn't forgive past dr- drug warriors. Nor should they easily. be forgiven. Um, I, my overall policy vibe check was uh, – Similar to the rooms, I think there was a uh, a reason slack comment, probably from Peter Suderman before he got trapped in the vat of bitters, uh, that this was uh, policy wise basically just sort of like an Elizabeth Warren grab bag, um, and that's not good. She makes bad policy. She has really bad ideas about economics. The single thing that um, probably drove me most bonkers on that front. And he's done this, I think, in in most or all of the State of the Union dresses so far. Um, but like the big applause line this year was like, and by the way, this is all going to be made in America. Um, 
we're still doing this, people. We're still doing made in America policies. Made we're going to do it till there is no more America. I'm sorry that, to say. What's that? We're going to keep doing it till there is no more America, I think. Wow. We're gonna, that we're, that sounds like a- Made uh, in America, but financed by Chinese debt. So we're still international in many ways. Red well, Let the silver Chinese. line in. Yeah. I like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, no, it's crazy. Like, you go on to the Reason site and just uh, do on search and then put it in the quotes so you get the whole term, uh, Made in America, and you will just see a laundry list of horrible, horrible, stupid- uh, and totally predictable effects of what happens when the government, as a buyer of things, um, decides to make those things more expensive and to make sure that you get less of it. Like, what do you? It's not hard to figure that out. And it was a huge applause line, bipartisan applause line. We need to, you know, make Made in America great again uh, or something. Uh, it is. Uh, it's a sign of the distressing, and yet not even like passionate uh, uh, kind of uh, populist policy consensus. It replaced last year's uh, bipartisan moment, which Biden totally forgot about this year, um, about Social Security, when he's like, yeah, they want to cut it. And everyone's like, no, we don't. And then everyone stood up and like agreed. And he said, great. And he thought he made a big win and everyone high-fived last year. And then this year he's like, they want to cut Social Security. (laughs) It's like, dude, you remember the thing that made headlines last time? Uh, Well, he does not. Remember Maybe. it. He does not. Um, so other uh, favorite or least favorite moments uh, round Robin, uh, Catherine, you lead us off. My favorite moment is uh, one that happens every year with Biden, which is that um, you know, you get the prepared remarks in advance. And so the, you know it's always fun to see where he's like diverged from those. And every year his speed traders cannot stop him from saying, by the way, I'm from Delaware. And that is why I love big corporations <laughs> every year, every year. And it's like... <sighs> It's just like I think I think that he psychologically got stuck at being a senator from Delaware. Understandable. He did it for a long time. It's kind of who he is as a person. But he just it's never in the speech. And he always (laughs) says it. And I just think his speechwriters must be like, "Okay, we're coming up to the danger zone. Is he going to do it? And then he does it every time. And I love it. I love you know, and he always he always does throw in that line. And I think this is the last Democratic president that we will see say this line, which is like he always says, like, I'm a capitalist. I love capital. America's capitalism. Like he always says some version of that. Um, and that's the Delaware talking to, I think. And then it's followed by a big butt. As and then it is like the mm. biggest but, but the but. greed is making things cost more. But your bag of chips in Heaton's That's metaphor right. yeah. is the greed. also small because of the greed. Because, you know, greed fluctuates on a regular basis. There's like a humidity index and a greed index. It's, and, and weirdly, it's like uh, oddly matches up to yeah. those inflation That's why whenever airline tickets go down, I go, oh, the airline the companies greed. are less greedy. They're the, spending I more time the, with their families. The lifting of the greed. Yeah, for the next one. So, yeah. you know. Uh, Nick, do you have uh, any favorite or least favorite moments not mentioned so far? I, you know, I think we briefly mentioned it, but the uh, Republican rebuttal uh, was just awesome. You know, it, I mean, completely terrible on every possible level. The delivery and, uh, was really interesting. Uh, it was fantastic. Just yeah. enunciating. I'm, yeah. Every. I, I have syllable. no idea. Yeah. You, you can't. She could have been whispering the secrets of the universe and you, you wouldn't be able to follow. <laughs> Uh, Heaton, uh, other bits you liked, uh, moments, the pageantry, do they still uh, do that? I I only watch this on C-SPAN anymore. Um, uh, but like, do the reporters and the anchors who are like trying to fill space beforehand while he's like shaking hands for 75 minutes before the speech. Oh yeah. They, do they like, gosh, it's just the, you know, puts a chill on my arm to yeah. watch. They're, the they're pageantry. very good uh, at being uh, able know, to say, he's really going to nail this shot on the green, Matt. Yeah, yeah, they're they're is. able they're able to, the to absolutely reverence like golf commentators. For, you know, the horses that are coming up, they're actually from Sheffordshire. Like they're they're, <laughs> they're able to absolutely draw that out. They're great. The um the, the the cringy parts for me are the State of the Union address that just independent of all political philosophy. This is just what hit me viscerally. Um, even though half of why I watched this was just to see if Joe Biden gave a shout out to his good friend Robert Byrd, uh, and just to see if he like really dropped the ball on anything. I still cringed several times when he slurred his words. There were a few times where it was like he like he verbally lost the grip on a screw or something and you could hear it slip. And that just every time uh, it made me feel bad. And then the other bit, like, even though I, I really don't like the State of the Union address, I, I really don't like the heckling that happens in the State of the Union address. That always just makes me 
cringe a little bit. Uh, this time there was Marjorie Taylor Greene. There was a Marine who lost a son. And I, I just I, I don't like the screamy stuff. And so the, b- both of those things made me recoil. My least favorite moment by far um, uh, was the um, aforementioned walk up, particularly the selfies. Like the pregame selfies, the thing's supposed to start at nine. Okay. Uh, Daddy's got nap time over here. Uh, and uh, you're taking selfies. Like, don't take selfies. You're, was, you're an adult. Stop it was it. almost like he was drawing out how long it would take him to walk and allowing himself to pause every three steps to take a deep breath. Mm. Uh, he was also getting energized from the crowd. Let's, uh, let's be fair to him. Uh, all right. I you think know, Keaton had also, pretty good. It was like his green mile. Right. I do. Yeah, I do. Just, just want to note the energy immediately behind him when he entered the chamber, Chuck Schumer. Like yes. the day that that doesn't happen is the day that something has gone so wrong in Washington. He's he's famous for the, right, like no more dangerous place in Washington than between a camera and Chuck Schumer. But like he he was right there with his little glasses down on his nose, you know, just like behind. And so that felt reassuring. I felt like oh well, some things are always right in the world. Always the same. I don't. That era is coming to a work. close, though. I, I mean, know. I'm, that's what I'm saying. The day he's not like, there is you know, an end of a. 900 and 1,000 years old. They're yeah. not going to be there forever. How old is Chuck Schumer? Is, can he run for president yet? He's um, being you know, kept they're alive. They're still counting the rings on uh, Chuck Schumer, so it's going to be a while. Yeah. He's being kept uh. alive by the hatred that, like, uh, emanates from people who want the things he's <laughs> banned over his long career. That's true. But uh, Chuck Schumer is the greatest friend to wealthy people. Like it, when the AMT was a big thing, he was always doing the patch at the end and he's leading the charge to get rid of the uh, limitations on state and local tax deductions. Um, so um, Heaton already won the category of best suggestions for making this better. But uh, what's what's yours, Catherine? I think we should probably get rid of the rebuttal. Don't you think we should get rid of the rebuttal? Like that's that's, that's that would make the situation better. Rule, kind of like a vestige. It's not. To, it's not. Hangover. Jesse Walker would tell us this is not legally required. We're doing this to ourselves, and um, no good comes of it uh, other than like mild amusement, I suppose. Um, but it's among other things, it like draws out the already too long process. Like I would be willing to accept a rebuttal if the State of the Union was 32 minutes, but it is hmm. not. That so. would be good. A time limit, you know, like an absolute time limit. And then, and like, you know, then the doors come down and they let the dogs out that patrol and safeguard yeah. the House Release of the Representatives hounds. every yeah, night. Yeah, exactly. You got to no, be think- out of there. Otherwise you're trapped overnight with Guard dogs. Like the and moment it, in which people could only receive information via their three television channels or whatever, I guess maybe the rebuttal could have made sense. But like there are plenty of ways for Republicans to share their thoughts about the speech. After there's the a speech. lot of people doing videos, looking at cameras like the ones that we have on our laptops as we speak. Yeah. Um, uh, and wearing a tie and saying things uh, during the and after the State of the Union. You can just yeah. do that. No labels did that. They did the, the pre. They did a pre uh, Oh, pre battle. Yeah. Which was uh, how about a side bottle? <laughs> how about a side bottle? Just in a minute, just start talking. Uh, Nick, what's your one suggestion for? Uh, I want improving? a, uh, I want a, uh, an extreme uh, hardcore uh, kind of uh, rap hip hop soundtrack. Mm-hmm. Lin Manuel Miranda, State yeah, of the Union. Why not? Uh, instead of having a sign language interpreter, you could have Lin Manuel Miranda just kind of do something in the in the bottom corner. Then we'd see how short he really is and feel pretty awkward. Well, you could film him full size, right? That's true. <laughs> um, I'm glad that this conversation is going off the rails. My one suggestion for all of it, besides the usual, make it written uh, uh, and limit it to and being nudity, a, re- of course. a report on um, what the executive branch did last year. Um, I think that would be great. Uh, but besides that, uh, no cell phones in the chamber. If uh, reporters Ooh. can't bring all their fancy gizmos into the Senate gallery, which is generally the way that that works, then uh, you, you don't get your stop with the selfies and you have to pay attention in class. Um, we're discovering uh, now in schools that when you tell the teens that they can't bring their cell phones in class makes for better class. So let's do that now also for Congress. And that is the end of that tune. So um, there's going to be uh, eight more months of this. Uh, of, of general election. Uh, it's 34 more weeks, 239 more days of the rematch that nobody wanted and everybody voted for. Uh, it is the, uh, uh, 
it's basically a toss up at this point. Trump's leading by a little bit uh, in polls, depending on how you ask the question. Um, usually when the terrible reality of the general election being set uh, between the two major party candidates uh, like hits, people reach for a drink or some hemlock or any possibility of a green shoot somewhere, uh, a window into an alternate reality uh, where there might be a third party candidate. Search terms go through the roof. People start looking around. So let's do ourselves a little heat check on some of the other names that are more likely than not to appear on the ballot. Uh, heat and I understand. Uh, rumor has it on the internet that you sat on a, you moderated a panel, not just the Academy Awards, but you were in South by Southwest with a certain RFKJ. Uh, so do you uh, want to tell us a little bit about what you found interesting about him or his candidacy or his voice uh, from a small L libertarian point of view? Yeah, I, I was at South by Southwest. I was going to moderate a panel. Uh, that ended up not happening, although it had nothing to do with me, I, I uh, hasten to add. Uh, but I did go to the event with RFK that they ended up doing at the University of Austin. So I saw him speak uh, along with, uh, um, my mind's going blank here, former Nadine ACLU. Strassen. Thank you. Nadine yes. Strassen, Nadine former Strassen, former yes. head of the ACLU. Right. Uh, I, I saw their speech and then I went to uh, RFK Jr.'s uh, campaign cocktail hour after that. Uh, and that was my first exposure to RFK Jr. I, I have not followed him. I, I've this is this is the first time I've seen anything other than headlines. Uh, I, I came in with pretty low expectations because I usually do when somebody's famous for being the son of somebody else. Uh, but I ended up liking the guy. Um, he strikes me based on what I saw in that speech as somebody who is probably fairly progressive in his economic bearings, but a civil libertarian very strongly. He had a lot to say about freedom of speech. He was very much in the absolutist camp when it came to freedom of speech. And, and you could hear him going towards maybe not a libertarian position, but at least a very cynical, uh, in a good way, understanding of the nature of power. He brought up at one point uh, how horrifying centralized digital banking is and talked ad nauseum about the system they have in China right now where your your credit card is now your face. You, you get scanned uh, in an app and that's the identification for your credit card. And if your social score drops, the Chinese government will then limit the types of transactions and the geography where you can do them. So you can go to a grocery store, but it'll only work at the grocery store near your house. You, you, can, you can no longer use public transit, things like that. Um, and, uh, and he had a line of, uh, I, I'm pretty close to quoting this here, any power you give the government will ultimately be abused to the hilt by that government. Uh, he had an idea that uh, he, he didn't strike me as the kind of guy that thinks that government is just when we all come together to help each other. He, he had a, an idea of, of the corrosive influence of power and then topped it off by saying that uh, trust the experts is not a feature of science or democracy. It's a feature of totalitarianism. So I, he does strike me very much as a civil libertarian. The other thing I'll add is uh, I think he's running a real campaign, which surprised me. Uh, the... Uh, we'll, we'll talk about third-party candidates here in a minute. There's varying degrees of vanity and colorful uh, characters that go into these things. Um, I'm friendly with Vermin Supreme. I don't feel like he's running a real campaign. I don't, I don't think he's sitting in, in, at night going, who would I make ambassador to France? I don't think he's doing that. Uh, Is that how we know it's a real campaign? Because <laughs> in that case, I <laughs> absolutely most, have run a real campaign. enemy. Actually, so. can, can I can I give a complete side note? Uh, I, I used to live in Washington D.C. Uh, Catherine or, or anybody that's been in D.C. regularly, have you ever come upon uh, Elijah the Nature Boy? Do you know who I'm talking about? Oh, uh, there is a mm. a guy that I I don't know how to describe him aesthetically other than Black Moses. So imagine uh, a, an African American man with giant bushy white hair, giant bushy bushy white beard who walks around in a loincloth with a stick. And he used to hang out. Oh, I've seen you know that what I'm talking too. About? Yeah, he he used to hang out in uh, um, Jackson Square, across from the White House, uh, when I was a Segway tour guide in this fair city. And so I oh, became friendly with paragraph him. Paragraph is cursed. Go Sorry, on. Sorry, I would. It's I getting would go, better and better. I would go have lunch with him, and uh, and he would tell me that God told him he was going to be president. And I went, well, hey, if if God's going to make you president, I'd love to be an ambassador. And he literally went, 
Andrew, I really like you, but I can't just appoint my friends to positions in the State Department. It has to be based on competency. And I, I was really impressed with the, the, the quality control. Is that wrong? Uh, with, with Kennedy, though, uh, I did not get the impression at all from his campaign event that he is running a vanity project or he is running for Secretary of Agriculture or to sell a book or something like that. Um, he had people that were uh, very efficiently running the event. He had a lot of security guards. And uh, it struck me as a thing where he's he's making an actual college try on this rather than just some bored attempt for a uh, spotlight. He has uh, raised uh, a level of money that we haven't seen mm -hmm. in a third party candidacy. Certainly the third parties themselves don't really usually have much money at all, but uh, you get uh, independent candidates can get some money. But he's in, in money can solve the ballot access problem to a great degree. Although uh, one of the funny things that I didn't get into and I wrote about this about a month ago um, is that there is a, uh, a third party ballot access signature gathering inflation um, because uh, there's a lot of people out there, <laughs> no labels out there getting signatures, the forward party. Uh, so they're bidding up the costs. I was uh, talking with a Green Party, a really nice Green Party guys uh, ahead of their uh, ballot access. Um, and he's like... Uh, yeah, all this competition is really driving up uh, labor costs. I'm like, huh? Yeah. That's Weird. Fascinating. Can you do the signatures have to be different for each party? Um, I think you can. I think they can be uh, the same one on different parties. I think so. Yeah. But I don't know. That's a good question, Mr. Gillespie. I suspect um, it Doctor, a lot. Doctor Gillespie. Doctor Gillespie. Um, other thing I'll say about uh, RFKJ uh, is that uh, he is uh, championing himself as a as a champion of uh, free speech and absolutist and in Dr. Heaton's terms. And uh, that uh, doesn't necessarily jibe with his long and storied career um, in uh, in free speech matters, which we've written about and talked with yeah. him about. Nick did um, in the past uh, where he was talking about the corporate death penalty for people who have wrong think on climate change. And, well, and he also, uh, it's a little bit slippery on the uh, social media front. Uh, there's no question that his uh, his posts and things like that were suppressed or, you know, went through shadow banning, sometimes outright suspension over COVID stuff. But he talks a lot about social media sites as a new public forum that really needs to be restricted and regulated by government right. um, and yeah. cites, you know, various cases where either company towns or malls were limited in their ability to shut down speech, uh, you know, political speech. So uh, it's, he's, he's a little bit cagey on, on that kind of thing. Catherine, um, the Libertarian Party, um, has, uh, for the last three presidential elections come in third place, which no third party has done since the 19th century. Um, it, it beats the Green Party in every single state, I think 50 uh, states plus DC, uh, for the last at least two elections running has three times the number of members of the party. Uh, as the Green Party or the Constitution Party or whatever, um, have about a half a dozen people who've been uh, competing pretty hard for the uh, the nomination, which will be determined in May in Washington, D.C. at their annual convention. Uh, Chase Oliver, Jacob Hornberger, Mike Termat, uh, Michael Rechtenwald. Do uh, Dr. Rechtenwald. Dr. Rechtenwald, uh, a lot of doctors, uh, uh, not enough patients. Um, <laughs> what do you find of there notes? A doctor this about... is the healthcare we need. Is there a doctor on Flight 93? Uh -huh. uh, what do you find of notes uh, about the Libertarian Party uh, uh, bid this time around? Yeah, there are actually uh, many, many more than the people you just named declared yeah. um, as potential candidates for the LP nomination, uh, which like we love to see participation, I guess. Um, their national convention will be in D.C. in May. We will probably go check it out. Um, I think that the interesting thing about the Libertarian Party this year is, well, first, first of all, I will say uh, last week or two weeks ago, I went on um, – Chuck Todd's podcast, which is, I just feel the need to remind our listeners here, called the Chuck Toddcast. Um, <laughs> and um, it's always delightful. He's always like a very good and kind of respectful and open minded uh, interviewer. And we talked mostly about the LP. And um, it was a reminder to me that that is still the place where most Americans, most people, get their information about what a libertarian is, right? Like the LP is still the face of libertarianism in many, many ways. I would like to think Reason Magazine, uh, perhaps also a source of information about what it means to be a libertarian, but uh, they do have the word right there in the name. Um, and I think that 
just having someone say that word and having that word be on ballots, uh, particularly in this election cycle when everything is bad uh, in the two major parties, is going to be valuable. I would love it if the Libertarian Party could not squander some of the advantages it's historically had, including um, 50 state or nearly 50 state ballot access. I think that's still a little TBD. Um, I did talk actually with someone in the LP about the fact that th this inflation of costs for signature gatherers, it has affected them too. And one thing they said is like, well, we can do it the old fashioned way. Like we can have party members go do it. We don't have to pay for these professional signature gatherers right. to go get these signatures. And that's an advantage that the LP has. They are a real political party <laughs> with real members in the states, um, which is not something we could say, for instance, for no labels. When I talked to Angela McArdle, the chair, uh, a month or so ago, uh, she said that anything uh, south of 48 states would be, in her uh, lights, considered a failure. They're not going to get uh, New York, and they're not going to get Illinois, The the probably. Mm. Um, they are early- The two winnable states <clears throat> for the LP. <laughs> yeah, totally true. Uh, they, the really onerous signature gathering requirements in, in New York's case- they change the rules in a, a really odious way. There's a lot of legal uh, contention over it. But um, the uh, the open question about the new leadership uh, of the Libertarian Party of the last couple of years is whether they would continue the momentum on ballot access. And there's some skepticism about that so far. And they definitely will be on, on fewer ballots this time around. I think one of the interesting things to consider is that now that we're at Trump versus Biden, again, this old people... Um, not at their best. We're not bringing mm. our, our best candidates yeah. out there. Um, imagine a world for a second in which Justin Amash was running uh, in that election um, uh, in a time when it's just obvious that there's a lot of sentiment backing third parties in a way that we haven't really seen since at least 1996. Um, that could have been something, uh, but just the way that everything rolled out, both for him, but for the party and its internal uh, struggles and, and dysfunctions uh, wasn't something that was able to line up. And uh, I regret that a little bit. I would have liked to see him run a full-throated uh, campaign against these two old people. I think he could have gotten somewhere, but, uh, you know, ifs and whatnots. Uh, Nick, um, you are studying uh, Brother <laughs> Cornell and Dr. Jill Stein. Yeah, uh, Dr. Jill and Brother West, which it sounds like an outtake from uh, The Basement Tapes by Bob Dylan and the band. Yeah. Uh, a, Jill uh, Stein yeah. of the Green Party, a recidivist uh, presidential candidate, <laughs> uh, and Dr. Cornell West, Brother West. Brother Cornell was his uh, autobiography, but he was going to be the uh, Green Party candidate, and then he decided that he had to go independent on that. And uh, neither of them bring much of anything other than slight comic relief and the freshest takes from Russia on just about everything. Uh, they are often accused, and Jill Stein actually, Hillary Clinton actually accused Jill Stein of being a Russian operative uh, not so many years ago, and then kind of walked it back and said she might have meant Jill Stein, she might have meant Tulsi Gabbard. But it was some broad who was, you know, uh, the <laughs> Matahari of women Putin. in general just tend to be pro Russia, <clears throat> yeah. you know? Yeah. Because, you know, you have to support all women, right? You're women helping women. Uh, but uh, no, uh, Stein and West, what is most interesting is, you know, they're both on the far left um, and they are both intense anti interventionists, um, which is something it will be, you know, neither of the major party candidates are really, you know, they're, they're kind of, indistinguishable on foreign policy. I mean, uh, Biden made a big uh, stink about how, you know, Trump wants to pull out. He, you know, he wants Putin to do whatever he wants. He made he had a quote, you know, where it's like, I don't care what Putin does, whatever. And the, so too. But, uh, you know, effectively, uh, Trump and Biden are pretty similar on foreign policy. And they're, you know, so there's that RFK to go back to Heaton's best pal, um, is, you know, a staunch, was a staunch anti-interventionist, but then has come out in favor of really helping uh, Israel in a way that gets under the skin of other, like, you know, principled non-interventionists or completists. And um, uh, Dr. Jill and Brother Cornell are um, both anti-interventionists and they are kind of objectively pro-Hamas, which is nice. So they really, really uh, say we should be out of Ukraine 
you know, because that's Putin's territory. And they also are really, uh, they both speak explicitly about what Israel is doing in Gaza as genocide without any hesitation and things like that. And I think from a libertarian perspective, what this shows is that there is still a, a large segment of the population who have taken the right lesson from the past 20 years, at you know, just the past 20 years of American foreign policy, which is that we are not very good at invading and occupying countries and that our foreign policy has generally made the world a more fucked up place than a better place. Um, but then when you start to get into the gradations of, you know, does that mean you should be actively anti-Ukraine winning its war? Um, does that mean that you should, you know, we should pull all support from Israel and, you know, champion, uh, you know, Arab terrorism within Israel, et cetera? Things get dicey really quickly. And I wish that somebody uh, like Justin Amash was in the race because I've heard him talk about this. He is the son of a Palestinian refugee who was displaced by the creation of the state of Israel. His mother is a Syrian refugee. He's an Orthodox Christian. And I have heard nobody talk with the, um, you know, kind of the insight and the equanimity about the Middle East, somebody like Amash, who is an anti-interventionist, but also recognizes Israel's right to exist, et cetera. It's like, we need more of that. And I don't think we're getting that. Uh, final point on third parties and in interventionism um, between uh, Brother Cornell and Dr. Uh, Jill, um, they're uh, polling in the five. Oh, they also will go with Sister Jill and Dr. West. So yes. it's pretty, you know, they're pretty open about that. They're polling at a combined 4%, um, which on one hand isn't very much. And on the other hand, we haven't seen um, left of center uh, candidate like, a, you know, objectively left of center where they're left of Biden. Um, a poll that high since the days of Ralph Nader in 2000 uh, suggests to me, besides but Ralph just, Nader had <clears throat> no effect on the 2000 election, Matt. We know that. Um, That's uh, what I was told. It suggests to me that um, that there is some kind of bubbling uh, anti-interventionist sentiment um, that Biden is facing from his left, and it's an issue. Yeah. It's an issue in some of the states where uncommitted did particularly well. Um, and it's something to watch going forward. It's certainly oh, and not- especially in a year when the Democratic Party is hosting its convention in Chicago. Chicago, yeah. You know, uh, Oof. which is going to be uh, history exciting. rhymes to well, uh, sound a little like Dr. West. You know, it's interesting. Uh, too history may not repeat itself, but it does rhyme, brother. The uncommitted voters who are uh, who are using the uncommitted vote or the none of the above vote to express their um, disagreement with Biden's foreign policy. It, actually, it's, you know, what what y'all were saying, like, if Amash was in the presidential race, he would be such a such a magnet for that sentiment, like in the general. And it would be actually quite cool to see what would happen if all of these like angry kind of pro-Palestinian lefties like surveyed the field and felt like the best move was to vote for Justin Amash. Like, I don't know, maybe that's the future libertarians want. <laughs> I well, I I think that's going to happen. Like event, I mean, because none of this is perfectly instantiated this time around. But these kinds of splinters and fractures are are there, and they're they're going to be papered over this time because we have the two eighty year olds, and then uh, you know Cornell West, Jill Stein are both in their seventies. RFK is seventy, so it's still an old person's election. Uh, Doctor Rechtenwald, the wreck the regime character, I believe, is in his mid sixties. So it's it's going to be an old an old person's uh, election, but in the next one after this, if there is one, um, all of that stuff will be in play. And I think the, there may well be a re uh, a kind of coordination of political interest based more on foreign policy as like as a major issue rather than a subsidiary one. Uh, no labels briefly. Um, they did announce on Friday that they are planning to go ahead with looking for uh, a candidate and trying to get in their vibe and the entirety of the existence of the organization as a nonprofit since 2010 has been, and it is explicitly in this election, more interventionist on foreign policy than Biden or Trump. And so their bet is that there is an establishment center of experienced politicians who are going to um, do one thing that I like, which is to acknowledge that long-term entitlements are screwed and need to be uh, dealt with in some way, which both major parties have just given up entirely. Um, that's good. And the other side is they need to out hawk everybody else. Uh, I think they're going to find that's a pretty narrow lane. 
um, when they, if and when they actually arrive at a singular candidate. All right, uh, we're oh, going to Matt, get. Matt, can you, as the no labels master, yeah. who who is the likely person that they're going to uh, try to impress into service? There Mansion isn't, Cinema. There isn't anybody. Mansion Everyone's, Cinema. Mansion's out. Larry Hogan's out. They've all said uh, no. Kristen Cinema's out. Um, uh, they they're running out of uh, w- uh, warm warm bodies. I heard uh, a rumor, maybe of Andrew Yang. What do you think of that? Uh, he's in the forward party, so that would be a little awkward. Um, yeah, uh, but it's a fusionist party. You can be a Democrat and a forward party, or a Libertarian and a forward party. So mm-hmm. you could be forward and no labels too. Um, that could be. I think that he's more outsidery than they would be looking for. Yeah. Um, almost everyone they look for is just like a John Huntsman, uh, Mitt Romney. Um, can, we, can we get Mitch so. Daniels to run? That would excite me. Mm-hmm. Mitch Daniels, uh, <laughs> let's keep your uh, your, <laughs> your peccadillos uh, private here, <laughs> Andrew. Uh, is just like thing. Mitch Daniels tried to. Uh, we're going to belatedly, sans further interruption, uh, get to our listener email of the week here in a moment. But first, a reminder that... This episode is sponsored by BetterHelp. Friends, what's the first thing you would do if you had an extra hour every day? Work on your novel like that annoying Jake Tapper fellow? Uh, Read books with rich vocabularies to your children so that Joe Biden doesn't get mad at you? Maybe listen to whatever new podcast Andrew Heaton has cooked up this week? Well, therapy can actually help you prioritize the things that are important to you. So time becomes less of an excuse for you to put off doing the work. This right here is where BetterHelp Online Therapy comes in. BetterHelp is an easy to use, super flexible, entirely online therapy service that has helped many listeners of this podcast cut through the distractions and dive straight into life's big challenges. All you have to do is fill out a quick questionnaire, get matched with a therapist. If you don't like the first one, just swap them out for a second. Let therapy help you make your days longer, but in a good way with BetterHelp. Just visit betterhelp.com roundtable right now to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash roundtable. Do it today. You'll be glad you did. Okay, reminder, please email your short queries to roundtable at reason.com. This one, edited for length, uh, comes from Bethany Del Lima, who writes, Dear Roundtable, help me. I live in Berkeley. <laughs> <laughs> and I've mostly only ever lived within a progressive environment. I've taken certain truths for granted, such as, Rich people do not pay their fair share, or that the main problem is that the U.S. doesn't fund education or social services enough like those other democracies in Europe, etc. I was a little red-pilled after, one, moving to Switzerland, yes, and realizing that our taxes there were lower, two, discovering that infrastructure, like rail, costs more in the U.S. to build than in bureaucratic France, and three, researching and discovering that we spend a lot more on education per pupil than any other place in the world, even in poor districts. Please help me break down whether the U.S. does indeed tax the rich fairly. So going after them is not a sound place to raise money, to lower the deficit. The rest of the email basically boils down to, is the American tax system regressive or progressive? Nick, you are name checked in the longer portion of the email. So I'll give you right of first refusal. And Bethany, I I will get that $20 to you as as, as soon as my next payday. Yes. So what say you, Nick? Uh, yeah, it, uh, the United States is incredible. has an incredibly progressive tax system where the wealthy pay an increasing share of all tax revenue. Um, I will direct uh, Bethany and all of our listeners to a recent interview I did with Brian Riedel, now of the Manhattan Institute, who has been tracking this. But uh, basically since 1980, which is a good time to start this, uh, because it's uh, the election that gave, that gave us Ronald Reagan. He took office uh, the next year and cut taxes. But in the top 1% of, of Americans, the average federal income tax rate since 1980, uh, the, the share, the effective share that they are paying, the taxes they are paying, is higher than it was in 1980. Um, and for the top 20%, it's about the same. And then for the second, third, fourth, and bottom 20%, it's all lower. Taxes are not only progressive now, they have gotten more progressive since 1980. Um, but that's and- federal income tax, right, Nick? I mean, part of the question is, look, there's state and local taxes, there's social security, there's sales taxes. How does it all wash? 
it all washes out that the rich pay the vast majority of taxes in every circumstance because at the state level uh you know you have things like property taxes so uh you know that you know people who own more property and own wealthier properties pay higher taxes sales taxes it's a little bit different but most states have uh refunds uh and rebates for lower income people so across the board the United States, when you look at it in the OECD countries, uh, which are, you know, countries uh, with advanced economies, uh, the United States is always at or near the highest level of pro progressivity. And the main reason for that is because what European countries have done is they've instituted a lot of value added taxes or VAT taxes, which are similar to sales taxes. They give more money back to people overall, but they do that by taxing the middle class. A couple of years ago, uh, Catherine, Mangu Ward in a uh, in a comment or a piece that she wrote had uh, talked about when people were saying you know every billionaire is a policy failure and things like that. She had mentioned you know what you could take all of the money you could expropriate all of the wealth of all billionaires and it would pay for you know all government at all levels for less than a year and it would be gone. So um, there is a lot of tax money out there. Most of it is actually paid by wealthy people. Is it fair to say, Nick, that the the state and local taxes are more regressive than the federal government? Like I, I, I believe you that overall the American tax system is more progressive, but at the state level, it's a lot more fees. If you're paying a, a driver's license fee, you're, you're paying fees on tobacco, fees on, on alcohol because it, that's just an easier way to bilk taxpayers. Yeah, uh, uh, some of that is true. And then in a lot of states that have onerous car taxes also will rebate that for you. Um, and again, that assumes that you will file for that type of stuff. But um, there's no question that sales taxes in general are more regressive and things like that. But again, when you look at the aggregate, uh, you know, it's it's the, the, the rich, if, especially if you define that as, say, the top 20% of income earners, at every level are paying most of the taxes. Catherine, uh, care to add? Yeah, I just think that this question um, and and so many of the debates that mirror this question are confusing. Um, I don't think the question writer is confused, but the, the terminology often confuses um, the paying of the fair share, that question, which is often looked at in terms of tax rates, right? So what percentage of your income are you paying in taxes, for example, um, versus the revenues generated from that quartile or quintile of earners, right? And so it can both be true that the tax rates on the richest people as a percentage of their income are lower and that those people are still paying the vast, vast, vast majority of taxes that they are generating most of the revenue that supports the government. Um, and I think that, that is the thing that people get confused about. Like rich people pay a ton of money in taxes, even if they're percentage rate is sometimes lower on paper than others. It's like so, the top 1% pays like 40% of taxes or something like that. It's, it's you know, again, wildly this disproportionate. Is what we were saying before about like it depends on if you do federal or if you do at all levels and which which taxes you include, it does it does get messy and confusing there, which is by the way a case for a flat tax which would be much more regressive on paper than our current system but would not have all of these complications and difficulties. Um but I think the key in thinking about this is to separate how much is the giant chunk of money that we need to run the government and how much of that are rich people paying versus what percentage of their income are they paying. And I think that the question that matters is the first one. Uh, but people who are concerned with kind of fairness or less charitably like revenge on the rich want to see that percentage go higher on rich people. Um, and it's just a different question. Uh, Heaton, you've constantly flippity flopped between red states and blue, mm -hmm. low tax, high tax. Have you yet made enough money to even know how much taxes you're paying? Heaton doesn't pay taxes. I, I have been, for tax purposes, both Swiss and legally dead since 1998. So <laughs> uh, I have not paid any taxes. Uh, I, I, I'm going to add a, a concurring opinion to all of this for our, our listener that uh, escaped from Berkeley that you can bring up when you're talking to your fellow coastal myth misanthropes. Um, uh, we, we've talked a little bit about the disproportionate tax burden that that the rich pay, which is true. And I've uh, like I interviewed uh, former Senator Phil Graham uh, last year. Uh, he had very similar things to say that that we we have a more progressive tax system on the rich. Uh, something that I'd, I'd bring up to consider when speaking to people from Berkeley that are lusting after European countries that they 
lost their virginity and while on a, a, a study abroad in college and therefore deeply feel European and more sophisticated than America, et cetera, et cetera. When you look at the money spent per person in OECD countries, America, Australia, Canada, France, Germany, all about the same. They're all about $20,000 per person. It fluctuates per year. But when you look at Britain, we typically spend more uh, per person than the United Kingdom does year for year. And we're again, we're about the same. The countries that are higher than us are the Scandinavian countries, Luxembourg and Switzerland. They pay maybe 30000 But we're we're in the middle of the pack with, with most of those countries that are far more progressive and you know cradle to grave. And so I would posit that the issue is not that we are taxing an insufficient amount. It's that we're pissing it away on stupid stuff. And that we should, instead of thinking about how do we, you know, get the rich over a barrel to force them to pay the the right amount of money, we think about how we're spending that money. And I would add to that that part of the reason that um, the European countries probably spend it better is that they're they're not functioning at that massive super state level that we are. Like one of the things I always bring up when I talk to Europeans, and this has been going for 20 years now, is I go, do you like your healthcare system? All of them go, I love our healthcare system. You guys are crazy not having a healthcare system like us. And I go, okay, I don't think our healthcare system's very good either. Do you think your healthcare system would work better if instead of having uh, Belgian healthcare or French healthcare or German healthcare, you just had a, a giant European healthcare agency run out of Brussels? And to date, having spoken to maybe 300 people, not one has ever said, I think that our healthcare would be improved by having a big superstructure. And so a lot of the time, these comparisons, I think, with European countries are, are not apt because they're issues of scaling. All right, let's go to our end of podcast, what we've all been consuming in the cultural arena. Catherine, why don't you lead us off? I am reading um, a book called The Face Maker, A Visionary Surgeon's Battle to Mend the Disfigured Soldiers of World War I by Lindsay Fitzharris. Um, this is, uh, it's a book about Harold Gillies or Harold Giles, I don't actually know how you say his name, um, who is the aforementioned face maker. This is a, a character that I've been aware of for a while because I do think there's kind of two kinds of people, which are uh, the people who do not want the medical details about things and the people who will click all the way down the rabbit hole of like, hey, what that that little thumbnail of a photo of a dude with his face blown off? What's that about? Click, 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 click. And then the next thing you know, it's 2 a.m. and you're looking at like a this incredible document, which is the book that this surgeon kept as he was inventing plastic surgery in the wake of World War I. Like, we did not have it before. And losing a limb as a soldier is sort of heroic, right? Like, oh, you know, you're going to be welcomed back. But at that time, people were not very good at handling disabilities generally, and especially deformities of the face. And so all these dudes were coming back with half their faces blown off. And um, this, this doctor was like, Let's see what we can do. Let's see if we can help these people and invented a bunch of really important techniques that we use today, um, not only in plastic surgery and reconstructive surgery, but also um, in uh, sex change surgery. So there's like a sort of interesting culture, cultural pathways that these techniques have taken. Um, and these are people who, you know, the, their faces don't look right at the end. But they have a face. Um, and I think it's just an incredible story of someone who was like invented a discipline basically out of whole cloth um, and did it under really tough conditions. And with tragically a lot of people who were interested in being guinea pigs because otherwise their lives were totally ruined by the horrors of war. Um, her previous book was called The Butchering Art. And it was about surgery, um, like Victorian era surgery. So there's a theme here. Um, but... Um, I recommend this for those who have strong stomachs. There are images. There are a fair amount of images in the book. Um, if you want to look straight at the horrors of war, but also be heartened by the things that people do to ameliorate and mitigate them, then um, The Face Maker by Lindsay Harris. Uh, Lindsay, sorry, Fitz Harris. Nick, what did you consume? Uh, so Matt, I will tell you because you're a fan of watching movies on planes and crying. Yes. I watched Joan Baez. I am a noise, a documentary about her that came out late last year. That is, if you are into the end of boomer culture, this is about her farewell tour. I highly recommend it because it also has multiple personality disorder mm -hmm. and, um, uh, possible, uh, recovered memories of childhood sexual assault in it. But my main, the thing I really watched is God Save <laughs> Texas, you Hometown Prison. You cheated. Uh, which is a documentary. 
by Richard Linklater, the wonderful director who gave us Slacker and Dazed and Confused and School of Rock and Scanner Darkly. Yeah, uh, incredible. It's about his hometown of Huntsville, Texas, where I lived for two years, which is the death prison, you know, execution center of, uh, of America and possibly the planet. And it is an incredible look at a town that is defined by having, you know, one of the most storied prisons in it. People like uh, Clyde Bower of Bonnie and Clyde were in the in the in Huntsville prisons, as well as Huddy Ledbetter. And um, but it's what do you do when you have, you know, when your hometown is known for executing people? It's an incredible uh, meditation and cogitation on the death penalty and execution, and then how people around it deal with it. And it has a beautiful ending, uh, which is Linkletter's oeuvre is inconsistent to say the best, but there's this moment where he's talking to an immigrant kid from Africa in one of the classrooms that he went to, you know, years ago. Uh, and it's just beautiful. So I highly recommend uh, Hometown Prison. Did you cry at Joan Baez? No, I wanted to. And, you know, I've never liked her music. And then the whole kind of spiral into the multiple personality disorder stuff. I was like, the um, baby boom is ending with a whimper, you know, uh, I think in many, many ways. But it's a very interesting document uh, if you are interested in folk music and kind of, you know, she's one of the, you know, real faces of the of the boomer generation. So it's worth watching on that. And she looks great for, you know, she's in her 80s and both looks and sounds phenomenal. Um, if you don't cry at diamonds and rust, you, you have no heart. You are the Tin Man. Uh, Heaton, what uh, cultural ephemera did you consume and would like to recommend to the listeners of the Reason Roundtable podcast? Uh, so I'm a very big science fiction fan, and I recently read a book called The Power by Naomi Alderman. And the premise to The Power is that um, for various reasons, uh, women suddenly begin to develop the ability to shock people. It's just a, a now all ladies on the planet have the ability to produce lethal levels of electricity from their fingers to anybody they're touching or nearby. And you start to see this incredible power inversion in societies across the world where certain Eastern European countries will start saying, listen, it's no longer safe for men to be unaccompanied by themselves outside. If you're going to go outside and you're a man, you need to have a woman with you to protect you from the, the predations of uh, other women around here. And it's, it's a really it, – it's a, it's a well-written fast book. It's not, it's not clunky. It's, it's just kind of good science fiction reading. Uh, but I thought it was very, very interesting in terms of – exploring power dynamics and gender without w without ever alienating me by being too political or by being too preachy or anything like that. It was just an interesting look at something from a very novel angle. I recommended this book on yep. this podcast five years ago. And so I will mm -hmm. be um, <laughs> electrocuting Andrew Heaton for not acknowledging <laughs> that once we get off the air. Um, I don't know who uh, recommended uh, this on this podcast since I tend to stroke out in the Since segment. you don't listen to this podcast? Why well, start now. Uh, but yeah. uh, I watched a movie that I wholeheartedly recommend and am and, and shocked by how much I enjoyed it. Wonka. The prequel. <laughs> Wonka. Oh, the new one? I, Wait. The new one. The new Timothy one. Chalamet. The new one. Uh, this Wonka. is amazing that you've seen a movie in the decade it was produced. I know. It's a little bit odd. But I have a kid. She kind of like a... I have two, but we only talk about the one. Uh, and she uh, keeps me honest of wanting to watch stuff, uh, was a delightful, delightful and surprisingly moving. And you don't even have to be on an airplane to cry, uh, movie. Um, it's the pre-story. It's got a, um, uh, kind of a steampunk vibe without like doing, I'm doing steampunk over here. Um, it's just like, uh, kind of subtly done. Um, it's the pre-story of Willy Wonka and, um, uh, and how he was, uh, wanted to make his fortune um, uh, in uh, chocolates and share his chocolates with the world, but then an evil, greedy cartel of three really sadistic uh, bad guys, which are, are wonderfully like rolled doll esque um, evil characters uh, and murderous too. Um, and uh, it's just like the songs are really great, and they the way that it knits together um, refer not just references to uh, the uh, Gene Wilder uh, incredible 
flop of a 1971 movie that became beloved afterwards, um, but that it connects you to the emotions that watching that movie now gives you kind of thing. I know that sounds strange, but it succeeds on that level in looking at basic information about this very successful movie from last year. Uh, saw that it was directed by someone I've never heard of um, called Paul King. And I realize now that Paul King is my favorite director because he made both Paddington movies, which are awesome. Everyone knows that. Um, and he made this one that I liked a whole lot. And he was the uh, director of The Mighty Boosh, the uh, aughts era Whoa. bizarro. Uh, the, the, the like acid trip comedy thing? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Which is incredible, which I have on DVD and I couldn't recommend higher. Uh, it doesn't make any sense and it's great. Um, so Paul King, is the, he's the man as far as I'm concerned. It's really, really good. Wonka, uh, check it out. Um, obviously, uh, if, Nick, if you haven't seen it yet, I'll just sell you on this. There is only one Oompa Loompa. His name is Lofty, and he's played by Hugh Grant. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And the, the best thing about that is he's played without makeup. <laughs> That's true. Uh, he's just naturally orange with green hair. Uh, but really good. Wonka. So that's it. All right. That's all the time that we have on this extended edition Reason Roundtable podcast and video cast. Uh, listen to all of our podcasts, including uh, Nick's great recent interview with Nate Silver on the uh, Reason interview um, over there at the reason.com slash podcasts. I would direct you also to our future events, uh, live tapings and such like at reason.com slash events. And I can see that the Soho Forum with Dr. Gene Epstein uh, has a uh, series of upcoming bangers, including a debate in May between Glenn Greenwald and Alan Dershowitz. And I don't even care about what the subject is. That's going to be incredible. Uh, so go check that stuff out. And if you like our organization and care to give a tax deductible donation, uh, reason.com slash donate will help you get there faster. All right. Thank you for listening. And thank you to Andrew Heaton for doing an able and willing job of, uh, of suitor filling, um, this time around. And hopefully we'll see you back here again soon. And, and whatever you're going to do in the DC office, uh, is going to be terrible and I'm going to love it. So thank you for all of that. Uh, I do a podcast called the political orphanage designed for people that don't feel at home on red team or blue team. Last week, I went down to McAllen, Texas to check out the border situation firsthand. I interviewed, uh, uh, Patrol uh, patrol chief. I spoke to people about the economics of illegal immigration. Month before, I talked to somebody about the law and economics of moon bases. And uh, then after that, looked uh, did a deep dive on Xi Jinping. So if that sounds like something you would enjoy, please check out The Political Orphanage. And thanks for letting me be here. All right. Goodbye.